I'd like to just say a few words and uh, show you a, a little bit about uh, uh, Franco Vasali's work. He uh, died in 1980 uh, and left behind a, a profound legacy. And at various points in my life, I've, I've tried to introduce uh, Vasali's ideas into new contexts. Uh, I know that there's a, a foot today, uh, an enormous movement worldwide of survivor and user. I, I, I think we should call ourselves victors, you know, rather than victims. Um, and this is transforming the way uh, mental health is uh, being carried out. I want to open by just saying uh, a little something about uh, a meeting I had in Trieste, Italy in 2010 when there was a large celebration of about 2,000 people who came to Trieste to remember the legacy of Franco Vesalia and to talk about uh, new initiatives that were taking place from Australia to Brazil and Argentina uh, throughout Europe. Um, I call this introduction the solidarity of the shaken. I first came upon the phrase solidar solidarity of or with the shaken during an extraordinary conference on madness held in the former manicomio uh, or giant madhouse of Trieste, the space where Franco Vesalia and his equipe of nurses and doctors and patients and uh, in former inmates initiated, challenged, and contested with their minds, bodies, and spirit the criminalization of the mad, <coughs> so-called schizophrenic, the bipolar, the manic, the depressed, the autistic, the insane. At this carnivalesque celebration, there were large tents and uh, uh, in very much in the Vesalia tradition, no one was to know who was a survivor and who was a mental health worker and who was an anthropologist or who was uh, a Marxist uh, revolutionary from Brazil. We all just merged together. Um, so uh, all of us met, nurses, inmates, psychiatrists, former patients, survivors, philosophers, uh, visionaries, luminaries, shared ideas, proposals, speeches, arguments, some hard to translate, some rambling, some abstruse, some scintillating, some heartbreaking, some hilarious, some tragic, some tragicomic, and a great many of them mad in the best sense of the term. Walking downhill from the Monocomio to the center of town, a big hike, uh, in the midst of a lake and unexpected snowfall, a young, unshaven, shivering, and poorly dressed young man approached me. He began to talk as though we had already met, and we were somehow in the midst of a long conversation. He described himself unapologetically as an itinerant madman from the Czech Republic. I know you, he said, but you don't know me. He said, you gave me a gift once, and now I have a gift for you. What, what gift did I give you? He replied that it was Anne Lovell and my translation of the selected writings of Franco Vesalia's Psychiatry <coughs> Inside Out, which was published by Columbia University Press in 1897, and almost immediately withdrawn and shredded by the same press around 1989 under pressure from the American Hospital Association in the United States and the American Psychiatric Association. He says the book, uh, my friend, who didn't give me his name, said the book was a revelation among his group of former psychiatric inmates and survivors in Central Europe who didn't read Italian or French or Spanish or Portuguese, but who could read the English translation. So he took my hand. He said we read it. We read it in small circles. We read it in the streets where some of us lived. We read it in flop houses, we read it in shelters. We distributed Xerox copies of our favorite chapters, Madness Delirium, Peacetime Crimes, Destroying the Institution, The Disease and Its Doubles. I thought you'd be here, and I've been following you to give you my gift. My companion's hands were as empty as I imagined his pockets to be, so I wondered what the gift would be. He said, join us, for we are the existentially shaken. And we are many. And he said, read Jan Potochka's 
Solidarity for the Shaken uh, from his heretical essays and, uh, and join us in solidarity. And um, I could go on with this description about how we ran into each other at various times, uh, but uh, I, I think that this metaphor of, of solidarity with the shaken, since it's, it's a better language, uh, I think, than many of the languages, because we've all been uh, existentially shaken at various times. We understand what that means. And um, uh, anyway, let me, let me begin with uh, the power of analogy, which I think is basic to Franco Vesali's work. The Italian existentialist and radical psychiatrist Franco Vesalia introduced the concept of peacetime crimes, crimini di pace, to express the relationship between war crimes and peacetime crimes. His awakening to a radical version of deinstitutionalizing uh, psychiatry and liberating psychiatrists as well as, uh, as patients, both had been colonized. His awakening occurred when he first entered uh, an Italian monicomio, a traditional state mental asylum, as a psychiatric intern after World War II. He was struck by a frightening odor and also a sense of deja vu. It was the odor of defecation, sweat, tears, and death that brought him back to the prison cell where he had been held as a member of the Italian resistance during the German occupation in Italy. That single terrifying moment was the basis of his equation of mental hospitals with concentration camps and the links between war crimes and everyday crimes, peacetime crimes. He noted that international war tribunals had just been established to try those who were guilty of war crimes, these, that these crimes were treated for the first time as crimes against humanity. Vizalia considered the psychiatric or the classical psychiatric approach to mental suffering as a crime against humanity. Meanwhile, when he uh, was offered a position, his first position to take over as director of a traditional madhouse was after years of his having been a traditional academic, a philosopher, uh, a uh, writer of scientific articles about the new uh, generation of anti-psychotic drugs that were coming in. So he, with some trepidation, decided to take this job as head of the institution in Gorizia. And what he encountered was, again, a wartime memory. That was psychiatric inmates who were in the hospital because they were suffering from what we today would call war trauma, or maybe PTSD. And here they were being treated after the war in a mental hospital with an array of medically sanctioned, sanctioned tortures, solitary confinement, physical restraint, the removal of clothing, exposure to cold, dirt, sleep, de sleep deprivation that they had already suffered when some of them had been prisoners of war. So this analogic thinking that enabled uh, anthropologists as well as uh, radical psychiatrists or social critics, organic intellectuals, ranging from Irving Goffman to Jules Henry to Pierre Bourdieu and to people like Judith Herman and others involved in the survivor networks, to perceive the logical relations between the camp, the war camp, mental hospitals, refugee and detention centers, the suffering of the immigrant, which is now our, uh, another classification of suffering, but to understand that that whether one is an unwanted refugee, whether one is a Mexican worker in California facing walls and deportation, or whether you're stuck in France in a horrible uh, refugee <coughs> center awaiting um, approval or not, um, that these all encompass forms of social suffering. And uh, also to his work pointed us to a real problem. That is the willingness of ordinary and good enough people, 
society's practical technicians, the technician, technicians of practical knowledge, the uh, practitioners of the social consensus, as various terms that he used, to enforce what are, in effect, crimes against humanity, against various classes of sub-citizens. And as I said, that includes the suffering of the immigrant, of the refugee, of the socially despised for religious reasons, the uh, invention of the category of the terrorist. All of these uh, are people who are thought of <coughs> as better off as dead, or perhaps better off never having been born at all. In the United States, we see, for example, in my state of California, the phenomenal growth of supermax prisons, uh, the almost casual imposition of solitary <coughs> confinement, and the introduction of lethal chemical injections in the executions of death row prisoners, many of whom were mentally incompetent by law. This took place in the absence of civilian dissent. One of the three drugs used in, in execution, chemical executions in the United States is a synthetic form of the Amazonian poison, curare. What's interesting about curare is that the Amazonian Indians uh, only used it to paralyze fish. They never used it on their enemies because they thought it was such a lethal uh, drug because it paralyzes the, the body with that and leaving the, the mind free. Uh, so they didn't use it in tribal warfare, but only to stunning animals that were then immediately clubbed and put out of their misery. So I think the steady evolution of American prisons into concentration camps for African Americans and Latinos is another case in point where war, war crimes and peacetime crimes quite literally blend into each other and perhaps paved the way for the war, the illegal war in Iraq, and for the shame that we bear for <coughs> Abu Ghraib. Um, what I'll do is, um, a few of the things that I'd like to address before we open this up, I'll show you some images, I'll say, tell you a few things about, um, about Bezalia. Um, but I would really like us to talk about the question of violence. Uh, because I think structural and symbolic, or what I call sometimes also everyday violence, uh, is what we need to be dealing with. The epistemological violence of psychiatric categories, classifications, diagnoses, um, and uh, the, the veil of suspicion that's cast on anyone who has entered the psychiatric system, always and forever viewed as representing uh, lives that are not translatable, that uh, a logic that can never be, be pierced um, uh, or is metaphorized <coughs> and reduced. Anyway, so uh, when Bizzoli was asked, uh, what is madness? Here was his answer, and I think it's the best answer. I think madness is a continuum, so I refer to a continuum of violence, but I also think there's a continuum of madness. <coughs> he says, I don't know what it is. It can be everything or nothing. It's simply a human condition. Our problem is, to, is how to recognize madness where it originates, and that is in life itself. For Bezalia, the real question was, what in the world is psychiatry? We can't continue to set aside the individual while waiting for a better understanding of what it is that he or she suffers from, thereby increasing their suffering through years of internment, social segregation, exclusion. Instead, let's set aside the diagnosis of the illness as an empty act, an act of labeling, and seek to create <coughs> with the patient the possibility of, of a life. Um, Roberto Benedice in Italy, who is not part of the democratic psychiatry movement, but is the head of the Franz Fanon Center, has said something quite similar. He said, the diagnosis is a temptation. Everyone wants a diagnosis. That's the problem. The, the, the psychiatrists want the diagnosis, the psychiatric nurses want it, and often the patients want it as well. There is a pleasure in diagnosis, but there's also many, many risks. And he said, for me, I am always reluctant 
to give a diagnosis because with that comes the cascade of treatments of psychotropic drugs that have terrible side effects that have never been proven to be effective. And uh, I know Pat will be, will be talking about that. So Vesalia went about his work of destroying the psychiatric institution and with it destroying and demedicalizing psychiatry. And I guess that's kind of a contradiction in terms. Why not just throw psychiatry out completely? But what he was trying to destroy was not just the architecture of these monumental buildings that were created throughout Europe and then spread through various versions of colonialism all over the world, these 19th century monasteries for the mad, which began with utopian premises, but had turned into uh, essentially prisons. One of the things Vesalius said was, I'm here with people who are kept against their will, who are being treated with um, medications that um, destroy their sense of self, that erases their memory. Um, and uh, so what we, what, we, what we need to do is, first of all, to enlist the inmates themselves in the act of destroying, literally, the institution. You know, many people uh, have people of good conscience, psychiatrists of great training have said, okay, but there has to be a pact with society. Psychiatry, like public health, serves, wears two faces and serves two populations and it has two functions. You know, one is to help the sick person and the second is to protect society, as in public health, for example. But um, he, he said that the main justification for locking people up against their wishes was not to help the patient, but to protect uh, society. And, uh, and the fears that people have, not of the actual violence of the patient, the inmate, but the fears of what they might possibly do. So that violence as a concept got confused with the notion of dangerousness. Dangerousness means you might potentially do something, and that's that veil of suspicion. And he said, in fact, most of the inmates he met <coughs> had been institutionalized so long that they had no aggressivity. And so one of the first acts he felt was to reach the buried subjectivity of the patient through their natural aggressivity. And so destroying the institution was just that. That is, he enlisted people to uh, throw hospital beds or mattresses that were soaked with urine or blood or whatever, throw it out the window, get rid of the cages that people were in, basically take down the walls itself and, and have pleasure in that aggressivity because that's what you've lost. To be human is to be aggressive. And that's different than being violent, because attacking a building is not attacking a person. It's attacking a structure. And so uh, this destroying the institution had an actual, tangible, material basis, as well as uh, a theory of, uh, of a, a theoretical attitude towards destroying a hierarchical structure. So that my, uh, one of my favorite images from Trieste is this poster where former uh, survivors, users, mental health workers are all, are all in it together in the straight jacket. Who's the patient? Who's the, who's the service person? Uh, I think that mixing up those, those roles was, was very, very important to dismantling this um, logic. And the law, 180, passed in 1978 was an abolitionist law. Uh, it um, abolished the mental hospital and it created community health centers on the belief that you could not maintain the mental hospital and community health services, that it was a contradiction. Uh, so no new admissions to mental hospitals and uh, of course the law comes into this so there's still <laughs> limited compulsory treatment. Um, so here's the continuing revolution. This was the celebration, beautiful Trieste. 
Anyway, the key words remain freedom, responsibility to each other. Uh, I think that the task of uh, undoing the harm that psychiatry has done is an ethical practice. So I think we need to speak in terms of the morality of psychiatry, the morality of treatment regimes, the responsibility we have to ourselves, to history, to memory, to the other, and of course the notion that freedom is therapeutic. So here are some people recollecting uh, Bizalia and the famous horse that was brought into the streets to celebrate the liberation of patients. And uh, of course, it's like every uh, revolution, it has to be continually remade and unmade. And um, I think there are people in Trieste today who are somewhat conservative about fossilizing and maintaining the, the movement such as it was in 1968 and others who say, let's go, let's go forward. But the main features, and this is from uh, Roberto Mezzini, who has come various times, Mezzini rather, to, to Berkeley, uh, is that the features are that there are four mental health centers in Trieste, one small psychiatric unit in the general hospital with a few emergency beds. There's uh, many services for rehabilitation and for residential support, day centers, and I think one of the most important things is the social cooperatives. This is a movement that comes out of uh, the Italian cooperativist movement. In Trieste, there was the uh, Ministry of, uh, Minister of Social Cooperatives from Brazil. Brazil has done away, has done many, many amazing things. One of the things it's done away with is um, you know, shadow work and um, you know, the uh, underground economy, except for maybe the drug economy. That's a, a hard one. But basically, anyone in Brazil who makes food or works on the street or sells gadgets or writes poetry or whatever, you can get 10, 10 or 12 people together, you're licensed, and you're now part of the formal. You're not an informal uh, part of the economy anymore. So I think this movement, which has to do with not just people with, who have suffered from mental traumas, but it's also for the unemployed and uh, for people who have been marginalized in other ways. Um, I think one of the things is to get rid of the distinctions between types of social suffering and to recognize, you know, people with mental problems, people with problems because of racial or gender or sexual bias or whatever, uh, uh, all have something in common. And again, back to the solidarity with the shaping. So today, only 21 persons under involuntary treatment, the lowest in Italy. No use of restraint, open doors, no use of uh, ECT, uh, no forced use of medication, uh, and no psychiatric users are homeless. The social cooperatives employ 400 persons, and each year another 150 trainees are uh, trained, and hopefully, I don't know how many of them actually find employment. Suicide prevention um, uh, is, is lowered, the, is very low right now, uh, the lowest uh, ratio in the last eight years. No one currently from Trieste is in one of these forensic hospitals for emergency care. So the question is empowerment, the development of a <coughs> newly shared kind of therapeutic culture, obviously multidisciplinary approach, um, abolishing the rigidities of professional roles, recognizing the validity of different subjectivities, shared power in decisions and initiatives. Well, by comparison, I'm not saying that the Italian model then or now is by any means a, sort of an ideal type, uh, but it's important to compare it with the centrality of mental hospitals elsewhere in Europe today, where there's a trend towards trans-institutionalization and re-institutionalization, and um, you know, the uh, rates of hospitalization uh, in Italy is much lower, uh, 4.63 per, per 10,000 in, uh, in, in Italy. Um, Germany, it's 7.5, France, 12, so quite high in, in France. And that mental health policies still are dominated by these large uh, madhouses, psychiatric hospitals, and uh, much less support given to uh, community services. Uh, Dr. Mezzina has uh, done studies of uh, San Francisco and Berkeley uh, and has some very harsh observations to make 
which I agree with completely. He referred to his shock uh, visiting the psychiatric services at the University of California in San Francisco's hospital. He's gone to um, uh, some facilities, uh, private and also public, in Oakland and in Berkeley. And what he was most struck by was the extremely <laughs> deteriorated physical, mental, social conditions of the mental health users. That is, they've been left to languish uh, without care, without basic care, dental care, health care. We don't have, as you know, universal health care. We can't get it through. Uh, and in very poor environments, both inside and outside, the clinics and hospitals, part of the problem being the, uh, the drug, uh, drug abuse, homelessness, and I would add to that also our, our, our war veterans problem, which is very high, and that complicates the, the situations, enormous fragmentation of services. And his questions are, again, Bazalia's question, what is psychiatry's function here? And I often question the great tolerance of Californians who um, basically uh, are just indifferent to the, the homeless that pile up on our streets and that are a scandal to us. So Bizzali referred to the disease and its double. So what is the symptom? What is the symptom here? And uh, one of the things he said is um, that diagnosis was a form of, of violence, uh, and the attempt to continually tinker with it, to have, we could go now beyond, well beyond the DSM-3, the DSM-4, the DSM-5, this elusive you know, sense that if only we could finally get the diagnosis correct, then we could maybe bring in personal genomics and we could make sure that everyone is getting exactly the kind of medication that they need. And he said, forget it, because what you're treating is the double, not the illness. We can never get to the illness because of all of the, the stigmas, the exclusions, the over-medications, the fact that the average mental patient in Boston at, uh, that had been uh, deinstitutionalized uh, into the community of South Boston had every diagnosis you could imagine. Because, as you know, much of the diagnosis is done in a very pragmatic way by drug, uh, by diagnosis by drug. First you give the drug, that doesn't work, you try another drug, you try another drug, you calibrate more, less, whatever. And so really what you're dealing with is not the illness, who knows what the original suffering is, uh, and is that suffering uh, an illness or is it malaise? So uh, this is uh, one small little uh, program that worked within a paradigm, attempting a paradigm of, of democratic psychiatry blended with uh, Dorothy Day's um, Catholic Worker Movement. And uh, actually it was based, uh, this was done in the late 1980s, there were about 12 of us, led by a former uh, inmate, John Cooper, who had a PhD in chemistry from Stanford and had lived on the street for quite a while. And we basically um, occupied land. I was a dean of university at the time, and uh, <laughs> I didn't stay dean for very long, um, <laughs> because what we did was uh, we thought that it was degrading that what was available for the uh, homeless, mentally diseased malaise, whatever, was plenty of food, but no shelter. People would come and, you know, it would be the Buddhists would come and the Hare Krishnas would come and the Christians would come and then there's the 25 cent meal you could go and rain or shine. There was always food, but there was no place for people to stay. So we um, raised some money, a really decent amount, and I went to the university as dean and I said, we can't have our university uh, surrounded by people who go through a very long and wet winter um, and who are sleeping in our halls those, and sometimes in our offices because some of the faculty have formed uh, relationships with them because many of the people in People's Park, there are many different categories, but one of them are people with PhDs who had um, you know, breaks and they feel comfortable at Berkeley because they could sit in on lectures and uh, often do participate in discussions and such. And uh, the dean of money, as I call him, said, I don't care how much money you have, we're not going to rent you a space to have a, a hospitality center. 
that'll just encourage more of these people to do. But I invite you to be a member of SOS, Save Our South Side. And uh, what Save Our South Side was about was giving um, uh, one-way tickets to people to other states, to other parts of California, to Southern California, name Florida, wherever you'd like to go. That's how we're going to handle the problem. So we decided to do an occupation. And we bought a giant um, mobile home, 40 feet, and uh, we hid it out by the waterfront, and uh, we hired some truckers, and at 5 o'clock one morning, 12 of us held hands, and we said, here we go. We knew exactly what we were going to do for the first eight minutes. After that, <laughs> we had no idea. So we played the Hallelujah Chorus as we went down University Avenue, and uh, Mainly it was homeless people in the streets who were looking at that. What is this thing with People's Cafe written all over it? And we even had a saw, and we sawed down posts, and we brought that big mother in. We, we actually used some of our people to divert police. So my daughter, Jennifer, uh, was standing on one corner saying that she had had a fight with her boyfriend and, you know, she needed help or whatever. And somebody in another corner was defecting the police. Well, so in those eight minutes, we actually set up this place, and we were serving oatmeal and coffee and uh, grits, because we knew that some people would like grits, and croissant for those who liked it. We had decaf coffee and regular coffee. And by the time the police got there, and they saw that about 300 people had been served and were inside uh, washing up, and there was a barber's seat set up, and there was a place for people to put some of their belongings under lock and key, and the police said, holy shit, <laughs> what do we do now? So I think that, you know, also in democratic psychiatry, um, there was the idea of taking uh, direct action. It isn't just about ideology. It isn't just about, it's about doing something. And uh, so there was a fight ensued between the city of Berkeley and uh, the university because they were both owners of People's Park which um, I, I, I dropped some of the images, but basically People's Park uh, was uh, an original occupation in uh, 1970, and, um, uh, and then it became eventually a place uh, that we, you would call a community living room for people who are in transit for today's pilgrims, for veterans from the wars, from people who had been deinstitutionalized and so forth. So the philosophy was a blend of this Catholic worker philosophy of Dorothy Day and Bezalia. Personalism, respect for the dignity, uh, autonomy, mobility, and freedom of every individual. Uh, a kind of, I don't like the word tolerance, but a radical tolerance. That is a recognition of the right to be emotionally and cognitively different. Uh, the, one of the things Bezalia had said about uh, diagnosis, he said, it seems to be all based on emotion. Either you have too much or you have too little. You move around too fast. You move around too slow. Uh, but there wasn't really any rhyme or reason to it because we don't have any sense of what uh, <coughs> we have sort of official norm of how much emotion you're allowed to have. And one of the beautiful uh, moments, I think, at the Trieste conference was an elderly man who was, who was brilliant. And he would speak very... Um, uh, thoughtfully and very philosophically about madness, but every few minutes he would cry, and he'd say, that was always my problem. It's why I ended up in the hospital. I'm a very emotional person. <laughs> and we'd all just clap and said, cry. <laughs> you know, If you're not allowed to cry, it makes no sense. So the other thing that the Catholic worker uh, philosophy is the right of the homeless, quote, mentally ill, to use public space. You can't run them out of public spaces. You can't run them out of parks. You can't put up, put up higher fences. You can't create park benches, which they were doing at this time in Berkeley and San Francisco, that were too little, like the airport, so you can't sleep on them. And uh, availability of, uh, of people who, who have a solidarity and probably have been mentally ill themselves. Who hasn't? Uh, availability for mediating with police, with the university, with the general public, to engage with the homeless mentally ill, and not simply to, quote, tolerate them by walking over their bodies, and direct action is necessary. 
There was, so there, we've done demonstrations against the use of ECT, and we've occupied uh, abandoned spaces and set up um, uh, trailers uh, near the waterfront. Very, very nice. Um, and uh, in, in 1983, I had written this article for which I took quite a shellacking, as Obama would say, uh, based on what I had seen. Benevolent anarchy uh, was, was based on a principle uh, uh, of understanding that life was filled with untranslatable moments, things that are not immediately understood, that reason and unreason exist together, and that... Um, uh, the, the safest environment for people that are having or going through an episode of social <coughs> suffering uh, is basically the, the, the freest, with the least medication. Vizali thought med meds were great. He thought medications, the new psychotropic drugs, they were great for the psychiatrists. <coughs> he thought they should take them so that they would calm down enough to be able to actually find the person that you know was on the other side. Um, so, and the whole movement is about restoring basic civil rights to human beings, uh, to give citizenship to people who are, I'm talking about the United States now, who are primarily homeless. Um, and that citizenship is a process. It's not something you have you don't have. It's, it's, it's a practice. Because we have a lot of people that are sub-citizens in the United States. I'm sure you do in Ireland as well. Some of these based on immigration status or race or sexuality, whatever. And uh, so we, we talk about sexual uh, citizenship as well as the citizenship for the alienated or whatever. All right, so some of these things we've seen. This culture, now being an anthropologist, Pat thinks that, you know, that this radical psychiatry approach that he's taking, you know, needs philosophy, you know, um, <coughs> needs phenomenology. And uh, needs, what can cultural anthropology do? Well, we've had uh, both ethno-psychiatry and a kind of a psychiatric anthropology, one that's more epidemiological, another that's more based on the premise that one knows that madness does not mean the same thing around the world. Even the uh, World Health Organization, when in the 1970s it had its famous pilot project study of schizophrenia, found that, well, yes, if you put people in a mental hospital, a Western mental hospital, you will notice some of these same things that we have drawn a line about, and we say, okay, this is depression, okay, this is uh, schizophrenia. But in fact, um, uh, what's called madness means very, very different things in different places, and the most robust finding to date is that uh, in the third world, your chances of having a, an episode, let's call it an episode, uh, your chances of uh, having a good a pro prognosis is much higher than in an industrialized world because of less treatment, less, less confinement, less drugging, and because of an alternative understanding, such as, for example, spirit possession. Um, you know, uh, uh, Michael Lambeck is uh, a wonderful uh, anthropologist in Toronto, and he does not study uh, ethnopsychiatry, uh, but he has studied in, uh, in, um, among the Malagasy people who are great practitioners of spirit possession, he came to the realization that we all have multiple personality. We just don't use it very often. I know this from Brazil, where people are, are, are possessed three or four times a week, and this includes not just the poor in the shanty towns, but people who work in um, you know, the computer industry in Brazil or whatever. Uh, that is that people move, we have many selves inside ourselves, And uh, that's where culture makes a difference, whether it allows those selves to exist or to coexist, or what Vazali called labito stretto, or for, to force us into a tight-fitting suit so that we appear to be the kind of consistent person and, you know, sometimes just want to rip those clothes off, right, and be, be something else. So culture makes a difference in terms of... Um, how you get uh, recognized at the rate at which people will say, oh, there's something really wrong here, or whether they'll have an, uh, uh, an alternative uh, understanding of it. Well, this person is possessed by Iman Jha. So, of course, you know, she's hearing voices. 
because Nanja is speaking to her. So this is a project that uh, um, Tanya Lurman, uh, so Michael Darcy was here, was one, one of her protégés, is now studying, uh, based I think in part on the Hearing Voices movement, looking at uh, what voices mean in San Mateo, California, right around Stanford, where she teaches, in Ghana, and in Chennai in India. It's a, at this point, it's a very exploratory, comparative project. Uh, and asks very basic anthropological questions. OK, what is it that people are hearing? And these are just a few of the things that, well, it could be anything from scratching, like a field of rats, whisperings, sounds of passing cars, noise in the next room, uh, a rattling radiator that um, later becomes voices. Uh, some of the voices are internal, but the person says, well, it's not me. It's somebody else who's inside me. Uh, uh, Roberto Benaducci told the story in the Franz Fanon Institute of how he, dealing with a young man from Africa, an immigrant, who came to the uh, <coughs> center uh, his, uh, but didn't really want to speak. And uh, since Roberto had spent quite a bit of time in Africa, he said, I know about African things, so you can tell me. He said, would you know about sorcery? Yes, I know about sorcery. So the man said, well, you see, my father was a sorcerer, my mother was a witch, and my grandmother was a healer, but my father wanted to protect me uh, when I was herding, herding sheep, or I think it was sheep, or goats, perhaps. And so he said, you're going to be spending a lot of time out in the fields and on the mountains alone, and so I'm going to put an animal inside you to protect you. And he said, he put a panther inside me. And he said it worked really well until he moved to, to, you know, to Italy. And he said, now the panther it doesn't have enough to eat. I, I, can't, I can't feed it the way I did. The panther is very, very unhappy. And he's, uh, he's out of control. And I'm beginning to you know, worry that I might kill myself to get rid of the panther. And uh, Roberto was able to calm him down by saying, yes, but you have a grandmother who knows how to quiet that panther and use all of the cultural idioms uh, so that rather than saying this is a hallucination, this is psychosis, rather the question was, yes, you have a family that tried to take care of you and now you have this dilemma, but we can find a way. We can find a way within your own idiom you know, to heal that. Rather than a diagnosis, why don't we understand the face of suffering when people are telling us what their problems are as a narrative, essentially, of their life? And why don't we try to see their lives as an epic, as Ulysses, or as, uh, you know, uh, one of the great Irish e epics, or the Norweg Norwegian epics? And he said that, he, this notion of the epic, and helping people form their epic and form their life story is a battle with good and evil. It's a battle with the panther. It's a battle with, you know, whatever it might be. Uh, but that uh, that would be more useful than uh, than a diagnosis. Okay. So anyway, uh, the, in the U.S., as I think in <coughs> many uh, parts of the more Western industrialized world, the voices tend to be violent. They tend to say terrible things. But in these other places. Uh, the voices are often recognizable. They often are positive. They could come from ancestors, spirits, or from God. And uh, people say they know who the voices are. They, they, it could be a boyfriend, a sibling, cousin, husband's brother, former boss, and so forth. And sometimes they just tell you to do the right thing. <laughs> if I hadn't had these voices, I would have been dead long ago. They're what's kept me alive until now. The voices I hear are the voices of God. They don't talk about madness, but they speak about good things. So um, the other thing is that often kin are involved. The, some, the, the kinship, it could be the, somebody, grandmother, a dead person coming and scolding and telling them what to do, insisting on good behavior. But that people often cherish those voices. I like them. Voices, yes, it will keep up the talking, which is enjoyable. I've derived happiness by thinking about the voice of a beloved boy. So let me just say a few words, maybe, about Clahan and about saints and scholars. And then I won't show you, you'll have to come another time, I was going to talk about a total institution that's in, in a kind of reform inside out stage in Argentina, and that is the National Asylum for the Mentally Impaired, 
which was the result of political violence. That is, um, uh, <coughs> it's uh, a subtext of the dirty war in Argentina that has never been recognized was a war against the mentally incompetent, done uh, by malignant neglect, by just letting people escape, flee, <coughs> fall into uh, a swamp that was next to it. The doors were open, but the doors led nowhere because the asylum is located far into the country. Many dead bodies turn up from time to time. In uh, 2010, uh, a young man who got lost on the grounds of the asylum and was eaten by wild, either wild dogs or wild pigs. I won't show you the pictures of that. But um, in some places, uh, it's important to understand the powers of structural and symbolic violence. And um, I know that my work uh, is contested and um, by some parts of the community in Clahan, it's a, it's a painful uh, subject. But I think the question is, if you see yourself as a politically engaged person, I saw violence directed against a class of people and they were bachelor farmers. I saw them as ridiculed, despised, made fun of, called drunks, called unproductive, uh, worthless, and, and technically speaking, were forbidden to reproduce. So I've had discussions before Pierre Bourdieu died because he wrote uh, an essay that was only recently translated into English called The Bachelor's Ball. And his description of what was happening in France a little bit uh, about uh, uh, 10 years before uh, I did my work in Clahan was very, very similar, where he said that in Europe there was simply a war against the peasant class. Many of them were bachelors. They were, no one would let their, their daughters marry these men. They were sent to the towns, anything other than that. They were not allowed to dance. And for Bourdieu, uh, his ethnography, what he could do, is besides understanding the record, being a good clerk of the records, getting the archive straight, looking at the violence involved in who got land and how the land was distributed, at what age you died, who got buried in the graveyard, who was outside, you know, who was pushed outside. But then he takes a key moment, and the moment was the Christmas ball. And I had the exact same description of the Kaylee dances in Ireland, when the bachelors would come to the dance and they were locked out of the matrimonial market. That is, that they had grown up with the assumption that if they took care of the land, they worked for free. You know, uh, family farming depends on the exploitation of your children. That's just it. It's called a family. We all sort of mutually exploit. But at some point, you come into your own, you inherit the land, you get to marry, you have children, and you're reproductive. But at a certain point, for the Irish, it was 1974, when the, uh, they joined Common Market, and the first orders down from Brussels was get rid of all these farms. Have them retire, give them some money, consolidate the land, let's make you know, profitable farming. None of those men are making any money. They're non-productive they're non and they're non-reproductive. And uh, so naturally, they fell into a state of, of malaise. And at the dance that uh, Bourdieu described, the men were supposed to now know how to date. They were supposed to have the social capital to know how to court girls. When they were used to having your family arrange those affairs for you, it was not something you wanted to get involved in. And the same thing was true in Clahan. And the men in Bierne in France would stand like wallflowers, smoking their cigarettes, <coughs> dressed in their clothes that were not appropriate. They did a waltz they could do, but they couldn't do whatever the swing or the rock and roll that was just beginning to come in. The same thing exact happened you know, in Clahan. And the men then begin to mock themselves. That's where symbolic violence comes in. They begin to say, of course I'm worthless. And so one girl will come over and say, ah, oh, come on, for the hang of it, for the crack. Dance with me, Seamus. And all of a sudden, he's dancing to the bachelors, and he's dragging his legs and doing a terrible version of the dance, and then saying, let's get the heck out of here. Let's go for a beer and leave. Those are the kinds of moments that ethnography can describe where you can actually see how violence and symbolic violence <coughs> operates. So I did an ethnography that took sides. And if you take sides, you're going to expect the other side is going to fight back. 
I did not work with the people in the village of Clahan. I worked up in Balinalakan. I, I worked in Lisnake Lui. I worked in all of the places where the people were still engaged as bachelor farmers. And I loved those men. And I know that they appreciated my hearing their stories and trying to tell them they were not crazy. They were not abnormal. They were not ugly. They were not unmarriageable. They were, they were simply stuck between a rock and a hard place. And the only thing that was available to them was the conviviality they could have in the pubs. And because of that, they were called drunks. And uh, so this was melancholy and loss, not madness, among the farmers forced into voluntary retirement and families and individuals into double binds. And um, they were subjected. It was painful to me to see how the ridicule, the dispossession, and the double binds that did lead to hospitalization. Just a few pictures of this uh, mental asylum. Uh, Videla appointed during the Dirty War, uh, a very strange uh, psychiatrist who is an opus dei Catholic, Catholic, <coughs> very right wing, but who instituted nudity and wrote in his prison diaries when in 1992 he was finally arrested that, well, of course we let them go naked because, yeah, really, what's the difference between a psychiatric facility and a nudist camp? This was uh, 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 an institution of men and women. And he opened the doors, and the women got pregnant. And those babies, some of them ended up in the international market for babies. So this nudity was not freedom, <coughs> but rather a regulatory technique of dehumanization. And it was, um, anyway, just so. So at what point, then, do you act up? So this is in 2000, and in 2000, men being kept in cages. I was able to get some statistics and could see that during this regime that began with the Dirty War, or, uh, or began, uh, yeah, at the, from the Dirty War, but lasted until he was finally arrested in 1992, that, it, that most of the deaths were becoming of uh, people between 20 and 30. The causes of deaths, uh, weakness, malnutrition, uh, injuries, accidents, fractures, hypothermia, uh, bed sores. Uh, these are not sick people. These are people that have, and here was the 2010 man, young man eaten by dogs. That was declared a natural death, okay? So the open door was a trap door. And we tried to organize the, um, a, a digging up of the swamp to find over 2,000 missing people who have never been located. A good judge named Judge Masson, after I sent a report to the Ministry of Health, did his own undercover investigation, and his are official. And here I am meeting with him, and he was sharing data. And after three reports were submitted, two by uh, Argentine people, uh, human rights lawyers, and then by this judge, this now a reform begins, 2008, begins by painting the pavilions, taking the people out of the cages first and you know, trying to form community mental health centers, but within, <coughs> within the asylum grounds. But here's one of the young men that was in the cage, now talking, can't stop chatting. And you know why? <coughs> they love their clothes. That's what the arguments are about. Everybody's got tags on their clothing. Destroying the asylum, we introduced some ideas about how to use of this Agliani moment, turning the old prison cages into rabbit hutches. The dangerous and the aggressive inmates learn to express their feelings through music. Here's one of the staff members who said, you know what, four generations, our families in this little tiny town of Torres, their only job was the institution. We were all colonized. We were all institutionalized. We're all suffering from the same malady in freeing them we free ourselves as well. So that's the end. Uh, just that reforms are always incomplete. You cannot do deinstitutionalization within the grounds of the mental institution. And the great judge, Masson and Mercedes, after he filed his report, was declared mentally unstable and stripped of his office. I met him last in 2011. He said, Nancy, I'm an anti-mafia ex-judge. There's no place for honest judges in Argentina. Not quite true. But when it comes to this topic, this topic, because it is a secret, it is a, a symptom within Argentina that has never been confronted 
and that is the treatment of the mentally impaired under the politic of General Jorge Videla. So for that reason only, this judge is not acceptable. Others still wait for the reform to wait for them. So I'm sorry if I went over time. <laughs>